Hello, hello, folks. We're back with another episode of Drama Quest 34 or 35. Can't believe we've gone on this long. Um, but today we're joined by Cocaine. He has many other names, but it's the name you might recognize him most with. And he is one of the developers behind Project 2002. He was a prominent member of the guild Armed and Hammered on the Alcabor Project. And he's going to be here today to talk to us about uh, sort of the history that he has with EverQuest in the, the history of Project 2002. Before we get into that, though, I do have to thank our newest patron, King Op, aka Dudat. Thank you so much, King Op. Uh, and it was good talking to you today, uh, this morning, by the way, King Op. Love chatting. Can't believe uh, some of the things we had in common. But uh, with no further ado, Cocaine, over to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, no, this is kind of exciting. Like, I'd I guess it's been 10 years ago since the P2002 stuff, maybe eight years. But uh, my EverQuest career started in 99 on, um, I think it was the Povar server. And then uh, my character there was Valador, and then Povar split off into Zev, and then I joined Harmonium and some other guilds on that server until all the way to Planes of Power. Did you play with Triton at all when you were on Povar? No, I was just a nobody until the Zev split, and then I joined Odysseys on Zev, and then moved over to Harmonium, which was the top guild on Zev, um, from like Velius all the way to Planes of Power. Okay, um, you, I didn't. You, you eventually ended up on P ninety nine, but that was years and years and years later, right? So I ended up on P ninety nine uh, right after launch. Um, so I've been a something awful dot com goon for like most of my life at this point and so the the goons ended up like the core of inglorious bastards was goons so i ended up on p99 because of something awful and the goons and so um you know there's some pretty big personalities on something awful in the gaming community that ended up there and i just kind of went along with it so i was on p99 and i was level 50 for the first time that i think hate opened was my first raid with inglorious bastards and so I knew a lot of uh, the core people like Xerion and Trax and Kinswat and, and, and that kind of Ishan, the top kind of crew that was in IB. So were those guys I, all uh, were those guys all goons? Uh, I th- don't know if those were. I know Olympia was, Diggle was, uh, or is, um, and a couple other ones. And that's how I kind of got. Um, brought into it because my character name was stairs protected which is like a one of the oldest memes from something awful.com it's like this pusher bot thing that's like if you have stairs in your house you're protected because you can't go down the stairs kind of thing and so like they saw my name and they knew who i was and they were like oh you need to come join us because there's a bunch of games over here so that's nice. uh, how i ended up there um and so i played on p99 all the way through like the ib the transatlantic rampage split and um you got the i mean some of those guys are some of really good real life friends of mine even to this day still. And, uh, you know, so I ended up leaving right after Kunark launched because of all the drama. I just life, I was building my second company at the time and I just didn't have time to go do it. So, um, you know, it kind of fell apart. And then, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, kind of went on like a year sabbatical of playing EverQuest or whatever. And whatever the gap between then and ta- the EQ Mac, kind of thing when secrets created the uh windows client and everybody started playing on eq mac but i've been playing on eq mac before that on a mac and so like everybody just kind of showed up around me and i was like oh that's cool everybody's over here now and so so you had played on eq mac before the windows hack came out yeah i was playing on eq mac for probably eight months before the windows mac, uh thing came out so were you, what were you playing on? Was it, was it like an old school Mac? What was, I don't even know what, what Mac architecture was like back then. So it was power PC at the time. I had like a, uh, one of those white power PC Macs, um, mm. you know, the original iMac that was like the white frame border. There was like a 14 inch screen. So I was just playing on that, um, because it was pop locked and it like, that's the era I really liked. And so like, it was a really tight knit community and I was just kind of chilling on a nobody character, having fun. And then. All my buddies showed up. <laughs> so. Now, can you tell me? Tell me really quick the difference in community style between um, the Alcabor server, oh. the EQ Max server official, and P99. 
Project 1999, the player bases. I've, I've heard that they are dramatically different <laughs> cultures. So EQ Mac as a whole is more, if you, if you think back to like, and I think a lot of people can resonate with this, like the, the family guilds of EQ uh, early on where like everybody had each other's back. Like it was, it was meant to play, have fun. You didn't have to have big play time kind of thing. And that, that was very much like the community on EQ Mac. It's kind of like the best um, part of EQ, to be honest. Yeah. And, and I mean, there was a little bit of like competition between Temerity and some of the other guilds, but like it, it wasn't, they had good rotations. They didn't like shit on each other all the time. Like it was, it was just a very friendly, enjoyable. We don't want the server to go away because it's like our little slice of heaven. So we don't want to rock the boat too much kind of thing. And so hmm. it was a very, as, as somebody that was getting older, it was very refreshing to not have to worry about, you know, getting a fresh pair of socks to poop in when, VP spawn kind of stuff. And so yeah. it was uh it, it was a nice change. And so like, you know, P99, I mean, uh, being an IB and dealing with Dark Ascension and then all that drama and then, you know, training people on VP and like that that just was a whole different ball game of competitive EQ, which is fun if you want to join in the toxicity, but uh, maybe when I was younger, it would have been a lot of fun. But as I got older, it just kind of like wore itself out. Like it just wasn't fun anymore. Like I, I don't. Yeah, I mean that stuff. Fuck. And my experience is like fun for like a week. You know what I mean? But if it's going to be like a fixture of the environment, it really grinds on you. Yeah, I think the differentiating factor is, is if you're just doing it to like troll people, like it has a different level of fun to it, whether you're doing it seriously. And so like I found yeah. myself in much more of a troll camp towards the end with like, you know, get some and stuff would, you know, he'd say, hey, let's go to VP and train a bunch of people and, you know, like get on characters and go train people. <laughs> and like That was it. We just log off after that. We didn't compete for a mob or anything. It was just to do random things like that. So that the the competition on P99 just really honestly killed p99 is like mature no, to, like just for the benefit of the viewers um in in vshan's peak on p99 there was a basically a no customer service rule so training was not against the rules there it was free for all there was yeah. nothing they, they weren't allowed to do anything it was, it was very much supposed to be like the live model but it just got completely out of hand yeah like, and anytime anybody tried to kill a dragon in vp they were getting trained from either side so that's yeah, so like you, i don't i don't want people to think you guys were just like these hardcore griefers at that time yeah it, it was like he literally had groups that were meant to control the trains and groups to kill the, the dragon like it was like that was the dynamic of vp and like Yes, there were trains on live when I played on live, but it like it wasn't that level of hilarious toxicity. And it, like looking back on it, it's just so ridiculous that like it is hilarious. Like we we cared enough about pixels to like treat other humans like shit. So I mean, it's just, there's uh there's this phrase that I always think of when it comes to EQ competition, especially early EQ competition, and it's like it's not enough that I should win; those around me must lose. Right. And yeah. that is like EverQuest competition for a lot of people summed up. And I don't, I'm not saying that I endorse that, but that's how a lot of people operate. <clears throat> so you're on there, you end up going to the official EQ Max server, then the P99ers come over in. Like, how does, what, what happens from there? So I get on, you know, I'm playing and we come over. We, I, I really can't remember what our guild name was, but like we, we agreed as a group to do progression within the server itself. So like we started in classic to level 50. And then we, um, you know, killed the classic mobs and then we'd allow ourselves to level up. And like, we, we did kind of our own progression thing. It was like Gwent's and Swars and some other people were kind of leading that. And we, we were doing really well, but like the EQ map community was not accepting of this new group of people because we, we really we didn't have competition. We kind of worked in their rotations, but like they were so resistant to us. They didn't want us to be in the rotation. So we ended up having to just to go do things and like sabotage rotations just to play the game. And so that caused a lot of tension early on in um, EQ Mac kind of P99 players coming over. Um, but we made it all the way up to like Lachlan before things kind of got hairy. And, you know, we were thinking for Emperor when we kind of fell apart and kind of all went our separate ways. And, uh, I ended up like going all the way into Planes of Power and joining Temerity. But the uh, 
yeah i mean it, it was it was really fun like we had a really like controlled group like we were just playing we had scheduled raid times like there wasn't really like bat phoning or anything like that it was just kind of chill and I, and I think that everybody that was in that ib crew that came over like really enjoyed that part of it because of what we had dealt with for the past couple of years in p99 and uh yeah, so it, yeah, that's basically what we did. We did, we did our own time, uh, not time locked, but own like content locked progression. So, I I imagine like when I remember reading about EQ Mac, I remember Lucklin. A lot of that stuff was actually still on the rotation, like VT and Emp. So, is that what caused you guys to like break up in in that era because you were bumping against the actual rotation? And I assume there was resistance, but it was also like yeah. it was still a player made rotation. It wasn't a real rule. Yeah, so that's where some of the toxicity happened. Like Temerity was specifically blocking us from killing Emperor. Emperor, they would just go in and they had the timer and there was no variance, so they would just go kill Emp and like nobody else could get keyed for VT unless you were in Temerity. Um, and so like that was kind of the elitist stance that did exist on EQ Mac. There was some of that, like, this is our community. Like you're going to do it when we say you can do it kind of thing. Hmm. Um, and I, I'm not at all bad mouthing the people in Temerity because the people I, I met and played with in Temerity were wonderful people, but it was just kind of like the culture of like, this is our haven. Like you're in our world. Like we're going to allow you to progress into this area when we want you to, because we still farm this for all of our alts kind of stuff. Right. So you were very much an outsider and and they made it clear. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like Temerity, um, I for, for people listening, Temerity at this time had not been into Plane of Time. They were cock blocked by the, the Wrath Council event for like 10 years or actually like longer than 10 years at this point. So VT gear, I mean, is is very comparable to like elemental planes gear. So you could see why this stuff is still uh, really valuable to them. It's not really until you, until you get into plenty of time that you're just like, okay, VT gear sucks now. You know what I mean? So they never did that at this point. Um, did you guys ever try to like talk to them and be like, Hey, like wh- what do we have to work out? Or were egos just too big on both sides back then? <clears throat> it depends on who was doing the talking. Um, Cause eventually by that point, get some had come over, uh, get some's a famous P99 personality. And he, he, I know gets some very well. He's, I consider him one of my good gaming friends and like we're in multiple discords together. And he's a very level headed, um, but very stubborn person. Um, and I say that lovingly and he wants to have fun, but he's, he's not willing to be pushed around. And so like, I think the communication kind of broke down, um, of like, we want to do this stuff. We're going to do this. Like, if you're going to make us compete on it, we're going to compete on it. And we're from P99 and that's not something that you want kind of conversations that happened. Right. And, um, it, we, we ultimately like they did a great job of just blocking our progression. That's, like, we all had our shards. We, all we needed was the riff from Emp, but we just couldn't get an Emp. And we, we maybe got one or two, but the key for VP, you need your whole raid because things are just obnoxiously stupid in there with lots of AC and you just need bodies. And so, yeah, just well, you know, you know, guys, if you're trying to do self-enforced progression, that means you're level 60s, you don't have VT gear and you're up against level 65s who are just sitting there like probably all maxed AA by now and like BIS yeah. relative to the content available to them. So it's, it's not really a, a fair competition, not that anyone would expect it to be, but I can see yeah. where it would stop you. So how... How did this transition into waking the sleeper? Oh boy, <laughs> I forgot. You know, I had that in my notes here. Like that—that that was. So I think that was uh, the personalities involved. There was, I think, glitch, relapse, and uh, relapse. Uh, you know, I, I still am in contact with. He's a quite interesting character. But they, yeah, it's they, a person I want to spend some time on. If you if you have details, sure. I mean, sure. I mean, I you know. I talked to him like two weeks ago, I think. But the the uh, interesting dynamic there is that I think that we were so fed up of being blocked and stuff. There was a small group of people who just want like wanted to burn the world down, mm. and you know that that is some of the toxicity that spilled over from P ninety nine. I think there's a lot of of that, like like you said earlier, like we want nobody to win. And so they just totally went in there one night with like, I think like two groups of people and woke the sleeper 
it didn't didn't like they did it incognito like they went in anonymous like they didn't tell anybody they just went in on their rotation terms it happened and it was like the biggest drama bomb that eq mac had ever seen and that that is really what i think probably soured the relationship to end our progression period hmm. and so like if you were involved in that at any point in time you were not allowed in any of the other guilds like they wouldn't even accept your application you were just a, a black sheep forever Right. I mean, it makes sense. But then luckily yeah. Hobart came back and respawned the sleeper anyway. So, right. Yeah. Now you said that it was two groups. So does that mean that the main body of the guild wasn't aware it was going to happen? No, it was very incognito. It was <laughs> very like, they. I mean, it was probably two groups of boxes because I think relapse was playing like four clerics and <laughs> glitch had like his own team and like boxing was very rampant on eq mac like you couldn't do anything without boxing like i played three right. characters i knew somebody that was playing like an entire like six group raid uh, fate played like a huge amount of characters on the server and so um they leveled up a power level of a bunch of boxes got them sleeper keys by killing zlandakar and then woke the sleeper yeah basically. um so yeah, I, it, it was unfortunate. I remember, you know, waking up and seeing it and I was just like, what did you guys do? And then, you know, they're in their rhetoric of like, you know, screw those nerds and all this kind of stuff was going on. And like, the, the, you can go back on P99 and look at the Rants and Flames thread and just yeah. gauge the temperature of that entire environment. And I, I don't personally play into those. I don't enjoy that. I was equally upset because like, why are we rocking the boat on these kind of things? But it already happened, so it's not like I can do anything about it. Or yeah. did I have the power to do anything about it? There's that there's like that that saying that I'm reminded of by this story where it's like um the child that is rejected by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Yes. Yeah. That, that, these all line up perfectly to EQ players. Well, some EQ players. I'm not gonna play yeah. all of them, but I, I remember reading a lot of stuff, I think, from Relapse or about Relapse back when this was going down. And it kind of soured my opinion on on those folks because uh, it, it just seemed like a person who was there to grief for, for no reason. You know what I mean? And I think I remember reading about him like warping, somehow somehow gaining access to Planet Time on a level one to warp them, warp train them in Planet Time. So that wasn't Relapse originally. What happened there is... So the EQ Mac client, you know, Macs run on a Unix subsystem. So it was a Unix build through like some kind of translation layer to like work on the Mac. And so you could use a very common Linux debugging tool called GDB to attach to the running process because whoever at Sony compiled EQ Mac left all the debug symbols on. So you could connect to it and, and debug symbols are just ways that you can interface with the, the binary that's running to like know where you are in the code so you could interface with it using gdb and so there's i think i actually have it forked on my github still it's zamil quest and so zamil is the one who actually empowered that and so uh it, nobody actually knows who it uh, was but my biggest hunch is it was zamil because he's the only one that had the tool chain to do it at the time hmm. um and so he would you know show up in there and then you know it got out to the greater community and just like the original Mac requests once so uh, like this has been like the, the downfall of cheats and everquests period is that like the original Mac request when I worked on it back in like 2000 you had to specifically generate a signing key on your computer before you compile it so like you had to know something about software engineering to like use the tool right you need to like a little auth code string yeah. kind of thing right and so when they removed that like it just kind of went rampant and so like yeah. the same thing happened on EQ Mac and like it it caused this customer support nightmare. Huh. And so like, I don't, I do think relapse was involved in plane of tactics. I don't think that he was involved in the plane of time. Okay. I mean, it, it definitely oh. is like a different level of hacking than people are used to seeing to have character, like just ignore flagging requirements, you know what I mean? And be able right. to enter areas like that. But I think that you could just send the zone packet and it would just let you in. There was no, the check was completely client side when you clicked mm -hmm. on the thing. So like if you just sent the zone packet, it would just send you anywhere. That's wild. That's crazy. So um, not to put you in the, in the hot seat here, but do you feel, how much do you feel like your friends contributed to the shutdown of the EQ Mac server? 
I think they did. I'm, I'm not, uh, not going to deny it. Like I think I was, I was upset about it because I was pretty grumpy. Because um, you know, I at that moment I was an active member of Temerity, and I was reading, and we were in time mm-hmm. finally. Like you know, like and I kind of separated from that group because I wanted to go experience that in content again. But you know, the, we, we were still in Discord and you know, still friends. And they were like power leveling and um, doing stuff in tactics. And I joined Temerity after the whole like tactics training. Like we were never able to kill Rallo Zek for the same reason like the Emperor. Because every time you would spawn, like Temerity secretly would show up and like cause a pit war that would train us. Or just the, the, those kind of dynamics kept unfolding. So I was just like, you know what? I want to see this stuff. So like I'm just going to like suck it up and go. So once you were in Temerity, did you get the sense that it was like a small side crew that was causing these issues for you or was leadership party to that uh, decision? I don't know. They ran a really tight ship. Mm. And I, at that point, was just laying low on an, a wizard that I had created that actually had relapsed power. Like I bought relapsed two thirty 30 packs and he power leveled me a wizard to 65 with a bunch of A's. So, um, and then I, I joined Temerity with that wizard, uh, who was hilariously named after the something awful lawyer, Leonard J. Krabs. But, um, yeah, so like I was just kind of laying low, like playing a wizard, you know, wizard, you stand up, cast zero out of mana, and then you sit back down and like go do something else on your other monitor. So like I was just chilling in Temerity just to experience the content again. And I didn't really get into the politic dynamics too much because A, I didn't want people to know that I was remotely associated with that group in any way, but I'll, and also I didn't really have time for all the nonsense. And so like the, the like, it, yeah, I, it's incredibly unfortunate because it would still be cool if EQ Mac was around, but it's, do you think it would be around? I mean, like it's, it's been a long time since it got no, shut down. Do you, do you think that was coming anymore. sooner or later? I think, you know, after, I mean, I have built and sold two companies and I know how like, due diligence and mergers and cost cutting and stuff works. And I think it would have just been a line item in one of the acquisitions that it probably would have just gotten canned. That's kind of my feeling. Yeah. It wasn't any revenue generation happening from it. So, I mean, didn't they have, they had to pay like a monthly sub at least, right? No, because once Smedley made it free to play, it was Uh, free to play. Yeah. 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 That was, that was that was the interesting thing about that because when I started playing, I did have to pay a sub. Like for each account, you had to pay a sub. So like you know, I was had three accounts and I was playing three subs, and then it was free to play, and then, then the massive bot army showed up on on EQ. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's the danger of having having it free to play or having having uh, means for people to pay for accounts like through Chrono that they can farm in game. That's the problem with that all those systems, and that's why the emulator servers in particular are usually so strong against boxing because it just yeah. gets out of hand so quick. Um, yeah, the, there's no price tag. I think the free to play thing was a, a way for them to scapegoat customer support. So like if it's free to play, then they don't have to invest back into it to do customer right. support. So yeah. I think it was, it was a smart move by them to keep the community happy, but it was kind of like a signal of like, we're hands off now. Yeah. Um, now I've always felt like, um, when I read all that, I was like, okay, this definitely had an impact and in, in the server closing down now. But I, I always agreed that like eventually someone was going to be like, hey, what's this? You know what I mean? Like, and cut that off. But uh, who knows when it would have happened. It might have been the same time. It might have been a year later, two years later, five years later. But it would have probably would have happened no matter what. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, that but, server, did, did you guys kill Quorum and Temerity on EQ Mac or no? Yes, I wasn't there for the kill. I remember Neuron got the first breastplate, and Neuron was old IB. He actually went over to EQ Mac around the same time, or maybe a little after I did. Um, and he he worked his way up pretty high into Temerity, and he he ended up getting like the first plate Quorum breastplate on the server. Wow! So wow, that was, that was cool. And uh, but a little bit back to like the 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 friends groups like relapse drama, like I. I like I know Relapse personally very well. Like we were Facebook friends. I know he's been through a lot. So like when we played with him, like Relapse definitely had some addiction issues, and he <laughs> wasn't working. And he there was just a lot of stuff going on. Hence why he decided he would level a wizard for some thirty packs for me. 
And we still hmm. laugh about it to this day, but it's, you know, he, he was in a really bad place. And I, and I have a lot of empathy for where he was. Uh, fast forward a couple years from that, like he started his own landscaping business, was doing really well, and then um, fell down the bank, I think, and broke his neck. And, had, and he kind of like did a complete 180 after that in his life. Um, ended up having a stroke. And so like he still plays on the TLPs. Like he was playing on the servers with Gitsum and I, but he's you know much more mellow these days. Like he's very religious now. And um, he's, he's a total different person now. It's, it's very, it was very interesting to see that transformation. And I think he's in a much better place, but every once in a while you get that, that inner demon of his that like wants to come back out, but he's, he's really changed as a human, which is good to see. But, Back in those days, like when there was dependence, chemical dependency issues and stuff going on, it, it was incredibly toxic. And, you know, we just, you know, we, we were friends with him. We didn't want him to see him hurt himself or anything, but he just lashed out at anybody he could that he thought he could. And he got immense joy out of like poking people till they exploded. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that he's experienced some personal growth. Thanks for being so open about it. I know it'd be easier yeah. to just say like, yeah, no, he wasn't that bad or, you know, whatever. So I'm sure it takes a lot no, to, he, to like talk about your friend that way. And, and, uh, it's good to see that he's in a, in a better place. So were you guys on Oakwind? We were, we were on Oakwind together. Um, a bunch of us old IB was, you get some kind of crowd of Saldico out on Oakwind. Yeah. I see that. I see that, uh, get some is the guild leader for FTE now that fates has uh, gone to wow. Yeah, that was, a. Uh... I ended up so I stayed to classic over there, but I could not get around the the fate zerg mentality, and I, I'm not trying to talk bad. It's just like it was ridiculous to show up to play in the sky and have like 400 people, and then everybody fighting over scraps, and it's just like that's. I think TLPs are plagued with that, and yeah. it's just not enjoyable to me. Yeah, the TLP mindset is that there is a finish line and it's six to seven years from now and you lose half your roster almost every expansion you know what i mean so just like guilds are curbing against future attrition and nothing else because of instancing nothing else can ever kill a guild besides attrition and drama well there's the open world world kills that they wanted to compete against and that was just so in oakland it wasn't the dps race because they had encounter locking but it was a completely exploitable mechanic because all you had to do was it was like p99 first to engage and it was locked to you and you just had to kite it like we yep. were kiting kazakh thaw around like eating death touches until the raid force showed up kind of stuff like it's like it's just it was the same thing yeah so it just wasn't enjoyable unfortunately yeah. and, so after eq mac how do you end up on tac p yeah so what a lot of people don't know about my history in the project is that I was actually helping develop TACP after, you know, EQ Mac got sunsetted. So I was working in the forums, like doing some some little code stuff. Like I've been a software engineer for twenty two years now. So I, I mean, I worked in C plus plus C. I worked at NASA on some satellites and stuff like that. So like I am a very skilled developer, and I was learning about game development and didn't like helping with the. the the you know, preservation of EQ Mac. And so like I was working with speeds and Rob and that kind of stuff, but I, like my core group of friends, which is like Warhog who, and Tolan and, um, what's the other person's name at the time that, that were in the arm and hammered guild, um, on tack P like we were, Oh, Ishan was there. And it's one of those things. It's like, I was helping develop it. We were, you know, working towards, you know, other content. I was mostly involved in fixing, like, mechanics bugs, so, like, taunt and, you know, maybe working on some of the stuff that Torvin had done and, like, very early on. Like, you can probably go find my commits in GitHub on the project from back in the early part of it. And, you know, that's how I ended up there because I wanted to preserve EQ Mac because I liked playing on it. And, uh, you know, there's some drama that unfolds in that, which definitely should talk about but like the the reason i ended up there was purely for the preservation part and to learn how to do game development because i i i have been a back-end like systems programmer my entire career and i didn't know anything about game development so i wanted to learn so uh, when tac p launched did it launch with just like classic or did you guys try to launch with all the way up through luckland how did it work because i imagine did, there was a huge mountain of work to be done to get it uh 
to a, a more legitimate state of content of the, for the era. Yeah, so uh, the goal, I think, was some kind of time lock progression. And, like, they can obviously clarify this. But, like, the way it, it kind of played out is, like, it was time locked, but also when they felt it was perfectly complete. Because the goals of TAC Project, and this is really important to the, the, the why you know, I reached out to even have this conversation, is that, like, the goals of TAC Project were complete and pristine preservation of EGMAC. Right. And was Torben was, involved from, like, day one? I think so. Because Torben has a reputation for being a perfectionist, right? Oh, he's the absolute perfectionist in the EQE emulator community. Yeah, I've heard he's like, you know, incredibly talented, but he he will like, you know, he will focus on a thing until it's absolutely, yeah. Precision of like in the the 10,000s. Yeah. What do you you think of Torben? I think he was very instrumental. I think that, you know, he... (sighs) didn't like confrontation and when confrontation was involved he got aggressive um i don't have any ill feelings towards any of those guys it's it's rather interesting because you know we can we'll talk more about like why the split happened but like the, I, I don't have any ill will towards any of them and so torben is a very strong personality he was very good at what he was doing um but you know Again, the goal was complete preservation, and that was a good skill to have. Like, I think that he added a lot of value to that. And and it wasn't until, like, uh, I guess right before Oakland came out that the leaks happened of how all the stuff that he was parsing actually worked, and he got it pretty close. Like, it wasn't he wasn't too far off with all the work he did. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I admire what he did. Um what, I, I think some, one of the good things is you guys had a you guys had a bit of a heads up that EQ Mac was going to go down, and some people went around and parsed a ton of stuff, right? Yeah. So it was like Speeds and Rob went around and, and just sat in zones for hours doing packet grabs to gather spawns. Like they would shake your page's zone a couple times just so that they could get all the 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 spawn chances and stuff right to the packet grabs. They did they did a lot of due diligence and a lot of really good preservation work and in using some of the exports that were available in EQ Mac, but it, it, um, yeah, I do not think for a minute they did a bad job. They did, they did quite an awesome job. It's great. I mean, I can tell you, I played on TACP uh, like last year and it's like create, it's like stepping into a time machine. It really feels like EverQuest and, and, you know, you play on TLP or you even play on P99 and you think, oh, this is like old EQ. And then you play on TACP and you're like, wow, this is real EverQuest now. Yeah, they, they did a fantastic job, and, and with that that very strong goal of preserving, the, like they stuck to the mission, and I admire that. Like that's they did a great job, and it was really upsetting to hear. And like when you interviewed Seekers, that it caused the split caused a lot of anxiety for them because we weren't we weren't competing on that mission. Like that was not our goal, and so like the we can starting to that conversation, I guess, but the, the way this happened is I, I completely remember how the split happened is like Arm and Hammered was doing a Nagy raid and we were at Fire Giants. And so I, I've mentioned Ishan a couple times and I, like, let's do a brief history of that because it's important to the story. So Ishan is the original person that bought the hardware for P99. So Ishan bought all the hardware, gave it to Rogan to get P99 started. And so... Um, Ishan is a very interesting personality. Um, he's a, he's a very eccentric individual. And I think that that whole toxicity over there started because he wanted, you know, he scratched their back and he just wanted his back rubbed a little bit kind of thing. Right. And, you know, that, that caused a lot of like separation because they were trying to create a pure environment and they didn't want that kind of stuff going on. And there was like the RMT drama and all that stuff. So Ishan kind of got a very bad flavor in the emulator community because of some of that stuff. And, and I mean, that's, a problem, it, that's the problem with like accepting help from anyone is there's, it's like with human interaction, there's an implicit, I helped you, you helped me. Right. And it, at the end of the day, it becomes corruption so fast. Right. But by this time, Ishan hadn't played EQ at all since he got banned from P99. So he was playing on TACP with us. Okay. And on a character named Ishan and Rogan found out about it and told, and, I'm paraphrasing here, but from what I gather from the situation is Rogan basically told them that if they didn't ban Ishan and anybody associated with him, he would not let them use the EQ emulator login servers. Because there was speculation that Ishan was somehow DDoSing P99. Yeah, I've heard from multiple sources that Ishan 
threatened to DDoS the data center that they were using for P99? Uh, yes. So I know Ishan very well. This is an individual, and if he hears this, I'm not making fun of you. He does not even know how to install an application. Like I have to like team viewer to install something for him sometimes. And so like the, the fact that Ishan could be the mastermind behind a DDoS is completely amazing to me that, and uh, you know, maybe he talked to some other agent to do it or whatever, but the fact that they said that he did it specifically is just the most outlandish thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah. I think Um, what I heard was that he threatened to do it. I don't know that, I don't know if P99 ever actually got DDoSed, but yeah, that, that's for for what it's worth. That's what I heard from like a, a a number of people, but they didn't say it was Ishan specifically. They just said it was a member of Armed and Hammered. You're the first person to chat with me and, sure. and say like, oh, it was Ishan. Yeah. And so, well, this was even before Armed and Hammered had happened. Like this was like, you know, Rogan and Ishan had a very historic relationship building P99. Like Ishan flew him out to Vegas and stuff. And like they had a very monetarily beneficial startup relationship with P99 where Ishan was bankrolling a lot of things. And I won't go into the personalities or details too much, but there was definitely something that a lot of people don't know that was happening behind the scenes with that, that initial push of P99. Wow. And when that kind of fell apart is when this whole kind of thing exploded because they wanted to separate themselves away from him as much as possible. And then, you know, all this drama comes out of it and knowing Ishan, he just likes to pour gasoline on the fire because that's, he's from Boston and that's what he likes to do. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, he's a very well off person too. Like he's been very successful in his life. And so like, he doesn't owe anything to anybody and he doesn't really take shit from anybody. Hmm. And so, yeah, he might've threatened that. Does he have the skills to do it? No, he would have had to find some other agent to do it on his behalf. Um, but what happened there is because of him being in our, he was an IB with us. So he was playing with us in Arm and Hammered, like speeds just showed up and banned him because they didn't want to risk tax project not being on the emulation servers. And so right. they also banned anybody that had logged into his account. So yeah. Warhog, um, a couple other people got banned because they had logged into his account to help him level. And so, you know, we, we were like, what's going on? Can you explain this? And they wouldn't explain it because they didn't want to expose that this was basically a director for EQ emulator not to let this person play. And so I remember being there and Speeds was a very heavy, heavy handed individual. He was a really well mannered dude, but he ruled with an iron fist for some reason. He was like, the code's open source, go create your own server. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a log somewhere of that. And like, he said that to the wrong person because like I I've been working on this. I, I can go do this. Like this isn't a big deal. And so within 48 hours, we had two Dell 2850s bought off eBay going to one of the dude's house to put on his Verizon Fios connection to like start a server. And within 72 hours, we had a server up. Now it, it was based upon uh, the um, originally the, the project eq database and uh the the latest um version of tac code that i had had because i was working on it and the, the quest files from tac because i was also working on those and so like we started from a foundation of tac because we wanted to keep it in that planes of power error yeah era. and our goal specifically was to make a server that we enjoyed playing on it wasn't to copy eq mac in any way and so our goal is like having built like public facing software companies over the years and and exited two of them is that like good enough for people and like from a project management perspective is always the best thing. And so we, we've been really criticized for like the quality control aspect of what we did, but like we weren't going for a clone. We were going for an enjoyable play environment and they got really mad that a lot of people enjoyed playing on what we did. Like, I think we had population numbers in like the eight nine hundreds at one point because like we were, you know, it was enjoyable to play on. Yeah. I mean, pe- so 99% like, of people don't know the difference between perfect accuracy and like 90% accuracy. Yeah. And so like that, that moment at fire giants and speed was like, it's open source, go make your own thing. It was totally a chip because, you know, EQ emulators under a GPL license. So we just went and did it like, okay, you're going to tell us to get off. We're going to go do our thing. And then when they realized that, like they said that to the wrong group of people because you know warhog is a, a sysops administrator 
uh, you know, Tolan has an immense amount of EQ knowledge. And then we had, I can't remember his name. I think it was, his, it was Aaron or something was a Python developer that helped us do our Lua code. And then Lance came along for the ride and we'll talk about Lance in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, we just kind of did our own thing. Like we had enough people that could program. We had enough people that could do the database and system setup work. And then, you know, we, we got it running on this. I can't remember this dude's name, but we, he put him in his basement on his files. He put a rack and everything. His wife like literally blew her shit because the basement sounded like a fleet of shop backs running. Cause I don't know, like, there's a specific model of Dell server we use, which was 2850 and the fans just always were on full blast. And it sounded like a bunch of shop vacs. And we were running three of them. And, uh, it, you know, that's how we launched. Like that, that was our launch story. Like we, we, that, that setup lasted until classic to classic when we kind of did our time release. So the, like the, this, this whole like drama situation of like, we were pitted against them was specifically because speeds told us to, get off his lawn like, and, and we did i think speed said that to you guys several times right as issues cropped up with armed armed and hammered right yeah, he, he would come and like shout it in the zone or, or broadcast it like it's open source like go go start your answer if you don't agree with the way i'm running this and so we did yeah. he told the wrong group of people that and yeah. you know it's unfortunate to hear that it caused them a lot of anxiety but like i approached it just from a business perspective of like let's just Make something that we can get ahead of enough that we can enjoy playing it. Yeah. And then, you know, we can time progress up to planes of power. Now, I think the other thing is TACP was not very big about advertising, right? They were happy to have their small, tight-knit kind of community, sort of right, like EQ Mac was, right? They wanted the EQ Mac community, and they needed time to, they needed extended time to develop because they were on their perfect copy mission. Mm-hmm. And so, like, they, they took a lot longer to do th- things because they wanted absolutely correct dialogue text. They wanted, you know, multi-question to work perfectly. They wanted, there was a whole bunch of like, I remember seeing the spreadsheets doing tech project and they were like, they were enormous, like the, how they were working through and, and project planning on that. And like, they, they just had different goals. And so like, they didn't, they didn't want an influx of players because they didn't want to have to deal with the customer support part of it while they were building out this re so, and, you know, yeah, but it all comes down to that one fire giant raid in classic tack where we kind of did our split. I, I remember the night like it was not yesterday, but, you know, it's funny because our, our dev server actually lived at Warhog's house in, in Maine. And like, I remember like two weeks after everything went down, I had an old computer here and I drove to Maine because I, uh, I had why, uh, hotspot internet at the time so i couldn't host anything so i drove it to maine and i'm i'm in dc so like i drove 12 hours to drop a server off so we could have a dev server somewhere and so like you know that's how committed to this mission we were but that's uh, crazy the things we do <laughs> it's just to play fake eq i guess well, the realest version of eq you could play though i made a trip out of it like i went hiking and i enjoyed northern maine and it it's a wonderful place. I love it up there. And I stopped and saw Ishan on the way home because he lives in Boston and like just kind of made like a vacation out of it. But it was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how it all started. All right. So P2, P2, P2002 is up. What happens now? Once you guys officially launch, I, I <laughs> gather that there was some animosity that built, maybe not intentionally, but oh. it, it happened between Tac P and, and you guys then. So tell me, <laughs> tell me the story here. Yeah, so th- there was a lot of animosity because they didn't think we could do it. And when we did do it, some people got really upset. So, And at this uh, time, they were still open source, right? They were. They closed source when they realized that we weren't messing around and we were actually going to do this because they thought we were stealing their work. But on an open source project, it's not ever really stealing. Yeah, you can't you're, steal open source. Right. And this was my argument to them all along. It's like you committed to an open source thing. You told us it was open source. And now you're mad that we're using your open source to do another project based on your open source. And were you guys always clear that you guys were were using their open source content as like a foundation for your server? Or did you? Yeah. So no one was suggesting like, oh, we, we created this, but it was actually their stuff. Correct. Okay. And, you know, 
from that point on, we, we forked and we kind of diverged. And so like mm-hmm. I would pull things in that they would implement because they were important to the era and merge them in and, you know, add them on. But I was also pulling things from upstream pure EQ EMU and doing some stuff myself because like on P2002, I redid the entire inventory system at one point because EQ emulator is full, was at the time full of like null pointer problems and the server would just constantly crash. And so like I had watched cave dude on TACP like work through hundreds of these as well to like get a stable enough environment so that we could actually have a long running server that wouldn't crash when people like entered combat or something. And so like a lot of the work was doing that. And we, we really diverged a huge, a huge amount of code away from TAC project and to the point where like doing pools from TAC to like merge into our code became like, six hour operations for me. Wow. Like, like, so, but basically you, know. you guys could, de- because you were less stringent about perfect accuracy, you could develop forward at a faster pace and almost like backfill your stuff with their perfect uh, yeah. emulation later. Right. So we started from a copy of their database. We started from a copy of their scripts. We used the project EQ map files because we used the new map grid system that was an EQ emulator. And we just built upon it. So we used a combination of Magello and the packet captures that had been done on EQ Mac to like figure out and do a, a good enough job to recreate a Planes of Power 2002 era experience. And wasn't perfect, but I would say we hit 80% functionality, which was good enough. I mean, some of the stuff was a little rough, but people still got their quest rewards and it was good enough to like kind of fake it till you make it kind of thing. And nobody yeah. really complained. And our team was really good about fixing errors that people would point out right away. So like if somebody petitioned, like I had a Slack channel set up that would just message all of us. And if it was a scripting error, we I would just go fix it and hot patch it live within like 10 minutes because, you know, it was probably something simple. And so like we just kind of iterated like standard software development lifecycle stuff and just kind of like worked our way far enough ahead that we could still like log on every night and enjoy raiding with the community that we had, but also um, not have to do this for years. Like we, we were probably done developing P2002 probably like two and a half years after we started. Okay. So we didn't, we weren't on the same kind of mission tech was. Right. I mean, they spent what, like a decade? getting everything that they were exactly where they wanted it. Yeah. And it's great. Like I was, I've been on a couple times over the years and I think they've done a wonderful job and I don't have any animosity towards it. I think it's exactly what they set out to do. It would be really cool if they did, uh, now that they've got, ex- they got everything exactly where they want it. It'd be cool for them to launch like a classic server now. And like every exactly on the original timeline, almost like patch perfect sort of the way that P99 did it with green. It'd be cool if yeah, they did so that. I kind of, well, last year I had the inkling to start working on something like that using some of the P2000 code and our database merged with some of the tax stuff now that it's been done. But I, Secrets had actually helped me do some client-side modifications last year as I was working on it. But I was going to do it in the RRF client. So it was like a, a better client to work through and just kind of the user experience was good kind of thing. But I got too busy and didn't follow through on it. Um, I actually had Xerion helping me with it for a while, but we just, he owns a winery now, so it was harvest season and he like couldn't put time into it. I feel like every EQ emulator personality I meet, especially the developers are either like some hyper rich dude in like some obscure field or a guy who like is running the server out of his cardboard box. Yeah, there, there is no in the middle, that is for sure. But the, so that's interesting because like most of the people that I was in IB with and I'm still friends with IB are successful business owners. Like they're, Competitive they're, people usually are successful. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. they, they bring the same personality and meet the same level of success in everything they do. Yeah. I mean, Gitsum's only a couple of years older than I am. He's like fully retired now. Like, you know, I'll be 40 soon, so... It's, you know, there, there's a lot of successful people that came out of that, um, that group or were in that group. But to go back to kind of like the outfall in the community, like, so a lot of this blew up on the P99 forums because TACP didn't have a rants and flames because they didn't want that over there. And Speeds right, right. was very against it. And, but people would make these fake accounts and go over to P99 and uh, whatever the fires, this is fires of heaven at the time. I don't know what it is now. Yeah, FOH or re rolled yeah. at the time, maybe. 
Yeah, rerolled. And so like there was like these big like drama bomb threads going on and Reddit as well, I think was involved. There was Reddit posts in this, which I think you mentioned to me when we talked like last week. But the it, it got down to once it went over to P99, it's actually when we started having problems. And so like we um, Salty from Fishbait was a big personality on P99 and he was one of those kind of relapse people that just like to stir the pot. Yeah. So he was DDoSing P2002 using an exploit in the net code that, you know, I, I had it in my core dumps from GDB from running the server, but I didn't know enough about the packet processing on uh, EQ, EMU and EverQuest to actually like give it a, a good thorough fix. Like I could check the length of the packet and do those kind of things and make sure that it wasn't overflowing, but it was, it was in a packet. There's like these packets that the, contain multiple packets and so the size is different for each packet they kind of like stitch together then they like decompose on the server and they do different actions to like save bandwidth for like the dial-up days and he was exploiting this one line and like i couldn't figure it out so like um we had a player on the server, hazel i think she still plays on p99 like she's a wonderful wonderful i guess she's a lady i don't i don't actually know you know the internet but hazel reached out to Rogan for us and was like, Hey, you, can you come help us? Like I enjoy playing over here. Like and this group of people keeps crashing the server. Um, and so Rogan reached out to me back channel and actually gave me the code from P99 that fixes the specific exploit because huh. he was running into it with the same group of people on P99 and they finally fixed it. So he like, we pair program through it and we, he, like we got on, I think like a, google meet call or something and we just went line by line and like fixed it and so rogan was interestingly um helpful in that and so back to the ishan thing when we moved to p2002 like we had a conversation with ishan like you your character cannot be named ishan there's no ishan anymore if you want to play with us you are invisible you can play but your personality needs to stay in a box and so like nobody actually knew that ishan was playing on p2002 um, you know, they thought they just kind of evaporated. So, like, the help from the community was still there, um, and you know, they they helped us do a bunch of stuff. And you know, early on, secrets was on there, like speed hacking and running around and crashing zones and doing all kinds of stuff. And like, I went back in my uh, logs, and so like, it, like I was reading the thing, the screenshot that I sent you about the whole Lance and Green Grocer kind of stuff. But like the interesting thing about P two thousand two is we didn't actually market it. Like the core team was very quiet, and we were just kind of building the thing to play on. But we had Green Grocer, you know, we had Lance, we had uh, some other people that weren't obviously the most upstanding about some of the things that they did. But you know, Green I've heard, Grocer, I've heard endless drama about Lance in particular. Yeah. Well, Let's let's talk about the Green Grocer thing first, and then we'll get to Lance. So Green Grocer is this very eccentrically odd person who, like, I think is hilarious. And so, like, the thing he did to make P2002 successful from a Twitch standpoint is he set up his computer to play EQ on a drum set. And he would stream it live on Twitch where he has to, like, use the kick pedal to taunt and, like, move. And so he'd be, like, playing drums and playing EQ. And we got an entire influx of people from his antics. And so like, That's we, crazy. We ended, yeah. So we ended like the success of the people showing up to P2002 isn't even us. It was green grocer and his weird Twitch antics. Cause he, I, I, I'm trying to like compare him to like a celebrity personality, but I can't put my finger on it. He's just an incredibly odd, but hilariously eccentric dude. He's probably a little unstable. Um, and in, in, in a funny way, not in like a, like I am detrimental to myself kind of way. And so like he, we got all these people to show up. And so, but he didn't really like that secrets was affecting his success, I think. And so he tried to dock secrets for crashing zones and like the drama just started to evolve out of the community and not the development team. But we got a lot of the blame because we were letting Lance was doing quest developing for us because he's very, OCD and a little anal retentive. And he was actually really good at making sure that like that stuff was functioning and working the way it should have. So we, you know, it, you know, it was uh, the lesser of two evils kind of thing. 
Yeah. I but, mean, but it's, it's, I often find that people that I need to d- depend on because of their competencies are people who are like, it's, it's like holding a firecracker in your hand, right? Yeah, I mean, like Warhog's second job was keeping Lance in line. And Warhog's not the best at that because Warhog can get pretty hot-headed too, but like Warhog is more reserved about his hot-headedness. Like Lance is just full-on battle mode. When you when Lance does not agree with something, I don't know if it's his European culturisms or just whatever it is, when Lance disagrees with you, you better watch out because Lance is coming for you and often hilarious but also very toxic ways like i think you pointed out that he was making fake accounts on reddit as torvin and posting hilarious like satire versions of torvin posts and like causing all kinds of chaos and you know he would just go on the tack forums just to stir them up and like make it sound like like so like we did eventually have to kind of distance ourselves from him a little bit or, or at least squelch him a little bit to like you know, this is not good for what we're trying to do here. You're actually making it harder for us kind of thing. But how much can you actually control a person you don't know on the internet? Like, Right, yeah, a very limited amount. Like, I can ban you, I can stop you from working on the project, but, like, that doesn't seem like that's going to be worthwhile because then you're just going to turn all that attention to us. So we had to have, like, this balance of, like, chaos. Right, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really a drama person, but, like, I will say some of the stuff he did was funny, but it was also not the great humanistic approach to dealing with things. Like there was no empathy coming from Lance for anything. Right. And, uh, you know, that once we kind of like, once we kind of got through that really big quest push, like we were pretty much done our, our quest development, like before we even released Kunar like all the way through to Planes of Power. And so Lance had done most of that and just kind of like fallen off and just was a player. Um, that's right around the time that like Trust joined the team. And so the like the, the whole Green Grocer, Lance, Secrets, P99, Rerolled, Relapse ecosystem was going on. I mean, it's funny because it's just like several names that have just been big drama every single place they ever go. Yeah, and some of it's by design. I think Relapse was definitely by design. Like he, he definitely has a torch the world, or he did have a kind of a torch the world kind of thing. He's he's much more reserved now. Like, but I said he still he still gets those um, flares. And out of all the people, he respects Get Some so much that he will like do anything that Get Some says. So Get Some can just turn around and just like calm him down. And he, 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 all through Oakwind, he was. You would have never known it was the old relapse. So it's it's interesting there. But the but Lance, like I I didn't even remembered Lance until the your podcast with Secrets came out and he like blew up Warhog. So Warhog's gonna be the best man in my wedding here in a couple of weeks. And like Congratulations. Thank you. And uh it's weird, like an EQ player is gonna be my son. But uh the uh he was blowing up Warhog and he's like, I don't want to do this. I work for a school system now. Like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm like, I, you know, this, this is reminiscing for me. So I'll, I'll go talk about it. I don't care. So Lance was like, he like pushing what you like, you need to go set the record straight. I'm like, there's no record to set straight. Like we're just, we just did a thing like in the community thought about it, what they did. And like, it just kind of fell apart. Cause I, I was really much in the Rogan camp of like, I wanted to play on the server and I wanted nobody to know who I was playing. And so, like, I was very lay low. Like, I would do some shenanigans. Like, I'd go on Twitch and see streamers playing on it. And I would just go, like, in my GM character and, like, mess with them and have fun and just kind of, like, lighten the mood. But, like, other than that, like, I was just very, like, behind the scenes. And I, the, but, A lot I of the devs were playing. in, uh, what was that guild? Power Slave? Yeah, so I was not in Power Slave. On okay. Purpose. So Warhog and Tolan, the Tolan wasn't a developer. So Tolan was the leader of Power Slave. Because I told hmm. everybody on the development team, you're not allowed to be in a leadership position of any guild. That changed a little bit early on because the uh, Warhog was an officer in Power Slave later on. But uh, like we were very strict because we didn't want to run into the Ishan P99 problem. So like we didn't. Everything we did was crowdsourced, like the money we raised for servers. I mean, I pocket, I, I put up that front money at first, 
But everything else from then on was community funded through our donations on PayPal. Like we took no money directly from an individual to do some things because we didn't want leverage or toxicity or even RMT advantage to show up. Right. And, you know, like dealing with RMT was probably one of the hardest parts of that whole experience for me. But the, um, yeah, so we, we from the get-go, we're, we're trying to have a very – because it's hard. Like, if you, you build something, you want to play on it, you want to enjoy it yourself. But when the community finds you as a developer on something, like, the you know, all the conspiracy theories unfold. And so, like, we, we had to deal with those, but we tried to be, like, incognito enough um, that didn't happen. I was very successful. Nobody actually figured out who I was until Late Planes of Power. Um, Warhog, on the other hand, they, they figured out pretty quickly – like in Lachlan or something, because like he would be hot fixing things as they would be working on them to tune them. And then he shouldn't have probably done that. He's probably done it on the dev server, but yeah, he was like Skizor, Borgar. Borgar. Yeah. Borgar was, was who he was on there. And so like, he I've would done some up. research. <laughs> no, you're fine. That, that, yeah. I, I don't know. The other name doesn't sound chunky was the other one that was really big. Um, skis or it might have been Lance. I don't remember. Uh, but a lot of the other devs didn't have production accounts other than their player accounts. They had no. The only people with permissions on the production server were me, Borgar, and Trust. Mm. Uh, nobody else had access to do anything uh, admin wise on production other than the three of us. And then the GMs only had enough to do their GM stuff. And our main GM, Chunky, like that's all he did. Uh, oh, and then we had. Taloxis from P99. I think he had the same character name. Um, but he, he was actually helping me last year with some stuff. But he did a lot of coding as well. He was a .NET developer that wanted to learn some of the languages. So he was playing and helping. But yeah, so like everybody was like pretty chill and on the dev team didn't want any drama. But the community just kind of like exploded around our success. And like, it's the same problem that happened to P99. Like their success exploded the community of competition and you know, shit fighting all the time. So it's, we had, we had those things. And unfortunately, because we branched off tech project, that overflowed into the conversation as well. But Lance going out and attacking tech project for doing their mission, I still think was unacceptable. Yeah. Um, and he was very aggressive about it. Um, and I, I don't know the reasons why he was aggressive. I asked him to stop a couple times to like lay it out, like lay low, like they're doing something else um, and that kind of stuff. So like it, it, it sucked, but it, from a, from a human being, it sucked emotionally to have to deal with personalities like that, because like you're doing something that you love and people are fighting over it. And it's just, it was silly. Yeah, I could see it with Lance. So Lance's my interactions with Lance have been 100% positive. But he hit me up. He's like, "Hey, could I tell you um, my like my piece on the tech piece stuff?" And I was like, "Sure." And I came back to my computer. And I had like 250 Welcome unanswered DMs from Lance, and I was like, "What in the world is happening here?" I wish I still had a database dump of our project tracker because you could see the threads that he would create. Like if he just did that to you as a response, like he was. He's so OCD that he, and he admits it to himself that he gets carried away. But he, once he's locked on, he is locked on and it's coming. So, it's so what happened to you guys when TACP went closed source? How did that impact you? It didn't. Like people, like, I don't know why that they think it did, but it, like, it, it was unfortunate. I mean, uh, you know, cause we were, I was contributing back to them as I was fixing things. Like you, like Git doesn't lie. Like you can go back and get and look at the changes and the version control of stuff I was contributing back. And they went closed source because they thought that we were just stealing one for one changes they were doing. But I was managing upstream EQ EMU changes with my own changes and fixing bugs like to the RMT thing. Like I had an entire inventory tracing system that would like use UUIDs for items so I could see where they were going, which no other EQ EMU server had. And I had like Bayesian filters that would filter plat transactions so I could see large money movement and like really crack down on RMT and stuff. And like none of that, that all stayed in our closed source branch. Like we didn't contribute any of that back, but we were very diverged from TAC project by the time they went closed source. 
and they kind of like were using it as a jab, but it wasn't really a jab. It was just kind of like, okay, like, I'm sorry you guys feel that way kind of thing. I was, I think in the moment I was pretty mad about it because it was an open source project and it was GPL derived work, but it is what it is. Like it's just unfortunate. And how long did you stay? Like, are you still involved with, uh, I, I think, Wayfarer's Haven, as it's called now? No. So th- that's the other interesting band of drama that happened with P2002. So, like, after Classic happened and we outgrew the server rack in the guy's basement where his wife was having a meltdown about the servers, uh, Trust had recently joined the team to do some GM and some quest deving for us, and he was an IT person. And his work had just gotten rid of a bunch of like HP ProLant servers. And like we needed to move to a data center and we had funds in the donations. So trust really took over that whole initiative. And like he boxed up servers. He sent them to Kansas city to the data center where we found a colo. He set up PF sense and had all the VMs running. Like he did all the ops work for us and it was great. Like he did a fantastic job and I have nothing against him for what he did there. Uh, early on, he was very much in tune with us. We were working together, but the, the interesting thing about Trust is Trust wanted to mend their relationship with TAC and EQEMU. And that's that, that's noble. I appreciate that he wanted to do that. But he wanted to do it in a way that would kind of stifle the progress of what we were working on because he was rolling back a lot of changes that I had specifically implemented to fix bugs or stuff. And like he had these huge diffs. And you know he worked through recompiling the code for the better part of couple months in order to like finally get it so that he could commit the stuff that we improved back to EQEMU, which is great. Like, I'm glad that that got contributed back. It didn't get attributed to the team though. It got attributed to trust, which was kind of an irker for a lot of us, but you know, he, he did put in a lot of effort there, but as time grew on and we got, uh, he had a lot of personal things in his life that were uh, upsetting to him. Like, I think, you know, he, he had some marital drama going on. He like wrecked his car, had some job issues. And like, he started to get more and more aggressive to the point where he actually, it was basically a hostile takeover of P2002. Like he basically took it from us. Like I know people say we left because we were done developing and we were, but the way he came in, he basically just took everything because he controlled the servers because he set them up. And so like we, you know, Warhog's getting ready to have a child. I'm, you know, working on my second technology company that's, you know, about to break profitability. We just didn't have time to deal with it. So we were just like, whatever. If he really wants it, all you, buddy. Like, we kind of washed our hands of it. And, you know, he he took that and, you know, added the, you know, since he had synced his the code back up to EQU, he was able to pull down the changes, switch the clients, and kind of start for uh, releasing later expansions than Planes of Power, which was a goal he wanted to do from the beginning. So he was not really aligned on us with our stopping at Planes of Power goal. Right. So the 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 actual code I have left over from P2002, like in my archives, in fact, running in a server in my basement, is that end power, Planes of Power snapshot. And so like, you know, from that moment on, like it was pretty much his project. We kind of stepped away. And I think Chunky and... Um, even Lance at some point kind of stayed around, but the core of us people that could actually like were engineers and IT professionals just kind of stepped away to go back to life. And, uh, but it, it was, it was very tense between the dev staff because he definitely wanted to separate from our mission and he was really uh, cozied up to the EQ EMU community to like try to mend those things so that he could run a successful server and, you know, Originally, we were worried about Ishan being on the server, so we didn't even run the login server. We had our own login server, and so like he got us, he got them back on the EQEMU login server and all that kind of stuff. So like, they, they, I wish him success in it. I just, it, I just find it incredibly unfortunate about how it unrolled. And you know, like if he wanted to fork our code, I would have gladly said, take the code and make your own server. Like I don't care. Like it's open source. Like I'm, the only reason we ran closed source is because of the exploiting stuff that we wanted to. Make sure nobody was digging through our code for exploits. So are you guys on good terms or bad terms with him now? I don't have any negative animosity. I, I just think it's unfortunate. Like I, I would have a conversation with him again. Like I don't, I'm not going to do anything to like 
specifically like cause drama or anything. It's just, it's one of those things in life that I just wish we would have communicated better and mm. just kind of like ironed it out. So it didn't happen the way that it did. So at the time of recording right now, Wayfarer Haven is a, a server that allows three boxing. I think it's got some custom content on it, right? I don't know. I, I, I really... could be wrong. I, I'm not totally in the loop on it. I know um, that was a goal of his. I don't know if he ever got there because he, he was working with Zachary on some stuff and he was working with the person from the Shards of... Uh, Shards of Dahlia? Yes. Yeah, it says um, it's got um, content up through DON right now, Dragons of Norath. And three boxing enabled, formerly Project 2002, and there's 300 people on the server right now. 300 uh, accounts logged in. Do you think that is uh, a success? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I'm happy that those people still play. I think it's a lot of the, still the core players because I think uh, last week I went to their forums and checked, and like there's like posts from like Hazel and other people like celebrating seven years. So like I think that is a success. I mean, we built a good foundation. We had a good player base. Like, yeah, we, we had we had fun, and that is all that mattered to me. Like I at the end of the day, about, fun is the only thing. I don't care about any of the other stuff. Like it, we had fun. And we didn't we didn't try to do it at the expense of anybody else, which a lot of people think. Like we were just doing it for ourselves and because it was successful and because we moved faster than TAC Project, that people just showed up and, and you know, the antics on Twitch. But that we that night we ended up getting like over two hundred and fifty new users because he was playing EverQuest on a drum set. So Yeah, was, yeah. For a small EMU server, that's quite a large influx of users. All right. Well, I know you you didn't really do a ton in terms of, you know, developing that animosity personally that existed with TAG-P and P2002 P and all that stuff. Um, but I know that I, I highly suspect that some of the people involved in all that will listen to this. Do you have any message to like Torvin or any of those guys if you could go back and, and talk to them? Anything you'd want to say? Uh, I mean, I just wish we had talked about it more. You know, like we, we even we we sent hardware to tech P like we were, we were very involved early on. And I, I really wish that we would have talked through those things or, you know, or speeds, uh, you know, rest in peace speeds, like would have talked through those things. And like, I don't know why we were so at each other. Like uh, it just, you know, I know cave dude got really upset and that's part of why it went closed source, but I don't, I just don't understand the, how we ended up there. I don't understand why they were so at each other's throats all the time. And like, there were strong personalities involved in sure, for sure. But like, I would have loved to have more healthy conversations. Like I, I, I avoided it because I didn't want to take part in much of the drama. Um, I'm sure I gave my fair share of pot shots. I'm not going to ignore that because people were giving pot shots at me, but I just, you know, there's no, there's no negative animosity towards their project. I think they've done a great job. And I wish I could have been helping the whole time along and not having to do this split, but it is what it is. Like, you know, that's water under the bridge and, you know, I don't, I don't hate anybody. Like I, I don't have any negative effects towards any of them. Like I don't have any negativity towards secrets. I don't have, you know, any, any of them. Like, I'm pretty content with the way, you know, what we did. Um, and, and I just find it incredibly unfortunate that the community responded the way that it did. Yeah, there's there's always elements that are beyond our control, but I'm glad that um, there's no lingering animosity, at least on your end. And I hope that you know one day you guys get to chat with each other and and ensure that it's all water under the bridge. And you know, at the end of the day, we just want to make the best uh, EverQuest environment that we can for everyone to play in. Yeah, I can't I can't speak for Lance and any of the other teams, but like I can speak for Warhog and myself, and we, we just we don't have any. It's just you know, kind of chill. That's good. But, uh, all right. Well, Cocaine, it was awesome having you on. Thank you for coming in. And I mean, this was more than I bargained for. I was hoping to get just a little bit about P2002 P and some Tech P, but uh, the, the beginning part about uh, the actual EQ Mac server was very valuable. I've been looking for someone to talk to about EQ Mac. Uh, by the way, if you're listening to this and you know a ton about EQ Mac, hit me up because I'd love to do like a full history of EQ Mac, the, the, the 10 plus years it was around or whatever. I would love to see you get Zamil or Fate or somebody on here because one of, they were very ingrained in not only the drama but like playing on it for a long time. Yeah, um, that that would be really interesting. So hopefully they show up. But like the I uh, yeah no this is fun. I uh, 
I like reminiscing about this stuff because it was a good chunk of my life doing this as a side project. Yeah. And, you know, hey, who who knows where the future is going to lead us? You know what I mean? It's a, it's a strange world out there. And, you know, shout out to Green Grocery. Like, you should be in marketing. Yeah. Like, get your drum set back out and play some EQ. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed his streams. Yeah, I think he clipped the videos. You could probably go back a couple years and look, but it's 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 funny. <laughs> like, it's it's completely off the wall. Like, it, it, the creativity that he put into that controller for that rock band drum set to play EverQuest was amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, this has been fun. I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I might, I've been touring around with maybe doing another emulator server with, uh, some people, but at this point, like, you know, getting married and probably starting a family, I probably just won't. Yeah. You're only going to have less time. Yeah. But I mean, I, I have a, I could, I have a good solid starting foundation, so I wouldn't have to do a ton of stuff, but yeah. Uh, I, I'd love to get into game development, but you know, with what I do, it just the salaries don't equal out. So, like, it's just it's a uh, open source dream for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. All right, Cocaine. Thanks for coming on, everybody. This is uh, Zade, Cocaine, and Drama Quest out. <laughs>